Now, remember I said this paper was five years in the writing, so the initial report, um, actually there was an early report in the 1880s by Langdon Down in England that we're not going to go into, but the first 20th century report on this side of the pond and the one that really got this condition in the public eye um, was a five-year follow-up study. So it was both an initial report and a longitudinal follow-up study, uh, which is really quite remarkable. And what Connor described was a gradual improvement during childhood in terms of language, social skills, and cognitive flexibility. And I might add, there was no treatment. There was no ABA. There was no floor time. There was no picture exchange. There was no signing. There were no schools. There was no TSS. Um, there was nothing. And here's what he wrote. Between the ages of five and six, they, meaning his 11 patients, gradually abandoned echolalia and learned spontaneously to use personal pronouns. Language becomes more communicative, at first in the sense of a question and answer exercise, and then in the sense of greater spontaneity of sentence formation. And as we read through this, I want you to think about the progress notes that you read from therapists today. And I don't want to take anything away from therapy because therapy is a godsend and therapy makes a difference. But the challenge is to sort out how much of a child's improvement is due to the therapy and how much would have happened anyway. And that becomes a particularly acute problem when uh, trying to debunk various quack therapies. And that's a whole talk for another occasion. But you've got to keep this in mind as your benchmark anytime anybody brings you some glowing tale of miraculous progress. I'm old enough to remember John F. Kennedy's inaugural address. I'm sure quite a lot of you are as well. And he was talking about negotiating a nuclear arms deal with the Russians, with the Soviets. And he said, let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate, and let us remember that sincerity is always subject to proof. And the same is true when somebody comes up to you and says, such and such cured my child of spectrum disorder. Really? Show me the data. Because this is the bedrock of what would have happened without any intervention. Then Connor goes on, food is accepted without difficulty. Noises and motions are tolerated more than previously. The panic tantrums subside. The repetitiousness assumes the form of obsessive preoccupations. Reading skill is acquired quickly, but the children read monotonously, and a story or moving picture is experienced in unrelated portions rather than its coherent totality. And we now call this central coherence. Central coherence means the ability to see the big picture. So instead of seeing a person, a person, a person, a person, a person, I see an audience. I see a room of people. Kids and adults on the spectrum often still see things in individual parts. This can enable certain skills that seem unbelievable, but at the same time prevent the ability to generalize across situations that are similar but not identical. There's an example in the movie, Rain Man, where the waitress drops the box of toothpicks. And uh, Tom Cruise's character says, oh, there's 256 toothpicks, because that's how many there are in a box. And Dustin Hoffman's character says, 252. There's still four in the box. Because he could look and count. He doesn't have to count. He can just see how many there are. On the other hand, if you meet somebody and you've learned a social skill in one context, and then you meet somebody in a slightly different context, you can't generalize to something that's similar but not identical to what you learned before. So it's, I think of this like the Mississippi River, which is a, a mile wide and 100 feet deep. Now, think of the Mississippi River if it were 100 feet wide and a mile deep. You know, the channel it could cut through the rock, but just a very narrow channel that the uh, skills that people on the spectrum sometimes demonstrate, which are called savant skills from the French savoir, from which we get the word savvy to understand, are like that. They're splinter skills. They're highly, highly, I don't want to say practiced, but very strong 
in the area of identifying discrete parts of something, but very weak when it comes to putting the whole big picture together. And I'm going to show you some examples of that in a couple of minutes. And here's really, I think, one of the killer paragraphs in what he wrote. And the, the highlighting is in the original. The italics are in the original. Between the ages of six and eight, Connor wrote, the children begin to play in a group, still never with other members of the group, still never with other members of the group, but at least on the periphery alongside the group. How many of you have heard parents say that or read reports that say that? Right? Absolutely. And then he says, people are included in the child's world to the extent to which they satisfy his needs. All of this makes the family feel that in spite of recognized quote unquote difference, again, that's in the original, the quotes, from other children, there is progress and improvement. Now, I submit to you that most of the descriptions that Connor penned in 1938-43 could just as easily be poured into the report of any one of a number of children that we're following right now. And then we have to say, well, if this is the natural history of this condition, we need to study therapies in a randomized control fashion to see how much more better they are because of therapy. But it's very hard to get randomized controlled trials done in this field. For a complete copy of Dr. Connor's paper, go to www.drcopeland.com and click on Related Links.